Hi, I'm Anastasia Sergeva. I'm the Creative Project and Eco Initiatives Manager of Boucher. Boucher is a chain of bakeries and confectionaries in Moscow and St. Petersburg, which currently runs about 60 shops. Our first bakery was opened in St. Petersburg in 1999, and this year, we're celebrating our 22nd anniversary. The company has around 1,500 people in staff, retail workers, managers, and manufacturers. We also have a place in Amsterdam, Netherlands. It's called Oleg Pelmeni Bar. It's centered around modern Russian cuisine, the delicious borscht, pelmeni with different fillings, Russian drinks such as vas or mead, and many others. Various people come to Bouche, young people interested in modern trends, old people buying delicious bread, families with children who want to enjoy their weekend. Busha has become one of the symbols of St. Petersburg. Everyone who visits the city eventually comes with pleasure to our bakery, too. But for a long time now, we've considered ourselves more than a bread and pastries kind of place. Instead, we've been participating in the city's life. We organize festivals, create movies, set up various types of events, etc. In 2018, we began wondering about the impact we make on the environment. Oleg Lega, the creator of Boucher, has written the Manifest of New Sincerity. That's how we call our enormous project focused on making Boucher eco-friendly. He encourages us not to pretend to be good on the outside, but to be sincere and conscious about the way our actions influence the lives of future generations. In terms of the New Sincerity program, we've developed a project aimed to reduce the negative impact on the environment. It consists of five main parts. The first one is the energy saving program. We've replaced incandescent lamps with LED-based ones. Actually, this idea was profitable for us economy-wise, too, since our electricity bills decreased almost by half. The second part is sewage treatment, which, unlike the first one, required huge investments. We've installed grease traps into manufacturing sewers so that the water that goes through our factories comes out cleaner than the city water utility requires. The water utility has granted us an award for this project. It's called the Crystal Drop, which confirms that we contribute in water cleansing. The third part is reducing the usage of disposable products in our bakeries, such as those for packaging. For example, we used to wrap utensils in paper envelopes for each order, and we've replaced them with long-lasting metal containers. We've also replaced sugar packets that can't be recycled and individually wrapped wet wipes. We've placed sugar in sugar bowls and got antiseptic gel dispensers instead of wet wipes. Of course, we couldn't refuse either of them completely. Some of the clients are reluctant to use sugar in bowls, for example, if they order coffee to go, and some people require wet wipes in case they spill something, especially if they come with children. So it's more convenient to use a wipe, not gel. For that, we've created a self-service area where people can get anything they need in whatever quantities they need. The difference is that we don't add them to every order now, allowing our clients to get themselves, and more often than not, people decide they'd rather use sugar bowls than walk a few extra steps to get packaged sugar. In terms of the disposables reducing program for retail, we've replaced plastic bags used by our workers to pick up pastries and wrap them for the buyer. Obviously, those plastic bags were thrown out after a single use. We've been thinking for a long time about possible replacements for them, since we couldn't refuse them completely, and we came up with the idea of using silicone holders that you can put on quickly. They look a little like a duck's beak. These holders are multi-use and very convenient for picking up baked goods. 
There are many other projects in this part. I could go on about them for hours. But I'd also like to point out that due to the pandemic, some of those initiatives are on halt right now, because everything non-disposable is theoretically a health hazard since it can spread the virus from one sugar bowl to another. That's why we're waiting for the pandemic to end so we can return to our initiatives with renewed vigor. One of the difficulties we've encountered while implementing the eco-friendly initiatives in retail was the reaction of our clients. Some people were sincerely glad that our eco-friendly projects were finally coming to life, but some were disappointed. They left angry reviews, accused us of getting cheap on them for using sugar bowls, since using singular packages was more convenient or when we replaced plastic straws with paper ones, which are actually 10 times more expensive than plastic ones. Some of our clients thought we were cutting the expenses. It's because a paper straw gets wet quickly, especially in a hot drink. Since we couldn't communicate enough with our clients, those negative reviews came in constantly, and when we realized it, we started marking things up. For example, we wrote that this particular straw is only suitable for cold drinks. And we placed information cards next to the disposable stands, which read that paper straws are more eco-friendly, for instance, but they're not very convenient for hot drinks. So you could either use no straw at all, or if a paper one doesn't work for you, you can use metal or glass ones, non-disposable kind. Another project that was also quite interesting and is also paused at the time was one for deposit cups. We've borrowed the idea from a company in Berlin. It's called Recup. What they do is sell or give small plastic cups to bakeries, and the client can come to the shop, take that cup for a euro, get some drink, get a discount. They can use that cup, they can keep it or bring it to another cafe in the system, and that euro is returned to them so they can use the multi-use cup without any issues. So we came back to Russia and started thinking of a similar project we could implement within our chain at least, and we came up with one. We called it the Deposit Cup Program. We made pretty cups that were sold for 150 rubles or 1.5 euro so that people could buy the cup and get a 10% discount. The problem, but also a good thing, was that people seemed to like the cups so much they didn't want to return them. The idea of reusables was under question because people never brought the cups back, so we had to produce more. Also, there were clients who complained about getting used cups because they thought they could get tuberculosis or another grave illness because someone else drank from them. What those people failed to realize is that they drink from reusable cups and mugs in other bakeries that were used before. But our deposit cups were cleansed in factory dishwashers, and every bacteria that could possibly linger on them were eliminated. As a whole, it was a very popular project. The media wrote about it a lot. Some other bakeries took inspiration. They implemented similar ideas as well, and we're very happy it happened. The fourth part is reducing the quantity of waste we take out. We've organized the waste sorting program for manufacturing, the office, and partially retail. We use large containers in our factories. Multicolor. Every color stands for the particular kind of waste. And the color helps our workers identify the kind they need to put there quickly. At the office, which is more of a common area in the corridor, We've got a big garbage sorting zone where each worker can reach from their workplace or even bring some sorted waste from home. We collect plastic, metal, plastic bottle caps, glass, paper, and cardboard. There's also a container for old clothes that the workers don't need anymore. But if the condition is good, they can give it to someone in need. One of the retail wastes that we have piling up every month is the coffee waste. We've got about five tons a month. At the moment, we don't really know what we can do with it, but we also realize that it could be useful for recycling. For example, when we went to Berlin two years ago, 
and we've seen different companies that implement eco-friendly initiatives, and we've seen a company named Coffee Form. They produce mugs and cups from coffee waste. We were amazed by the mugs they make and wondered if we could learn about the technology they use to make them or buy them and resell them here in Russia. But the guys who work for the company told us that their main goal wasn't the mass production of mugs, but the possibility of reducing coffee waste. So if they launched a larger production, there'd be a demand for a larger amount of coffee waste, which doesn't really fit the initial idea of reducing the waste, not increasing it. And we started to think what we could do with coffee waste. One of the ideas was using it to grow mushrooms, using it as a fertilizer. But we failed because the company that grows mushrooms and sells them told us that mushrooms grow very slowly from our coffee waste. We couldn't understand what the problem was because we've heard a lot of stories about it working just fine as a fertilizer. We've looked for other options. And in the August of 2019, we met the Baltic Industrial Symbiosis Project team. That's when our fruitful co-working began. We started by discussing the general issues we were dealing with. In particular, we had that problem with coffee waste, since we had a lot of it and didn't know what to do with it. One of the options was the mushroom one, the fertilizer option. But we remembered our past experiences of the mushrooms growing too slowly, and we started researching why it was happening. And in the process of figuring out why our coffee waste worked so poorly as a fertilizer, we phoned a company called Beyond Coffee in Copenhagen, Denmark, and the company are experts in growing things on coffee waste. They make special growing kits, and along with the Baltic Industrial Symbiosis, we phoned that company and found out that one of the possible issues could have been that our coffee waste is drained, and the qualities normal coffee possess are lost when the beans are fried, when the coffee is made. Currently, we're trying out the method of growing mushrooms together by collecting coffee waste from our various bakeries and sending them to the living lab. Our second common project is producing fuel briquettes from coffee waste. It causes some issues that we are working at as well because there's not enough lignin in the coffee waste. The material that holds the briquettes together makes them more durable. All these projects are currently at work and we're looking for a way to create some useful products out of our coffee waste. Speaking of our working patterns, it's all in testing currently. Basically, we collect the waste from particular shops as is agreed. The ones where the required quantities of coffee waste are made. And all this waste comes to the factory. And on a particular day, someone from BIS team comes and takes it to their warehouse to dry it up and keep it at their place. The issue with coffee waste is that you always have to preserve it correctly so that it maintains the quality for a long time. It's very humid, about 50%, and keeping it for over a week can be the reason for mold growing. That's why it has to be dried before preserving. While testing out the collection of coffee waste, we've encountered issues with the collecting process itself. In order to collect it, you've got to think about the place, the container, some kind of a barrel to make the process more comfortable. And you've got to instruct the worker, tell them what it is, that it's not just some garbage to be thrown out. And bakery workers have a lot going on as it is, and they often forget to collect coffee waste. Twice we've encountered problems such as too little waste being collected, though we had 12 bakeries to collect from. And there was also a time when the waste came to the manufacturer, but it wasn't marked in any way. So the janitors considered it garbage and threw it out. And I hope our third attempt will be more successful. We've discussed it with the managers of the shops, that it has to be treated with more attention, while excluding the ones that can't collect waste for inconvenience reasons, because it needs more attention and planning. 
And we've included more shops that can participate in the testing. So soon enough, we'll collect our third party of coffee waste that we'll send to the Baltic Industrial Symbiosis Living Lab. One more part is eco-education. And it didn't appear at the beginning, since we never thought that we also had to educate our workers about what was going on within our big project. It's subdivided into two parts. Education for workers, which includes contests, various newsletters, eco-friendly gifts for holidays. What we do is try to explain in a simple way what it is that we're doing, what we're doing it for, and how they can help. The second part is organizing different events, tours abroad, for studying too. We meet various companies that have already implemented some strategies and can share the issues they faced, the successful decisions they made. This type of events is always useful, and when you leave, you're very inspired and ready to rock. Also, a few years ago, we started producing merch that used to be called Peterby. It was called that way because we've shot a few movies by that name, about St. Petersburg and the people here. But it was more Peter than St. Petersburg, so we made merch, hoodies, sweatshirts, t-shirts, mugs, thermal mugs, bottles, pins, etc. And we sold those in Busha. About a year and a half ago, we opened a showroom in Moscow called Gorod Vopreki, the city against all odds. Another St. Petersburg story. And we sell our main, our basic collection under the same name. And we also sell new collections, design in collaborations with famous photographers, some renowned guys, so that everyone can find something for themselves. All in all, we really hope that the lockdown will be lifted soon and we can go back with new ideas for the old initiatives and a few new ones. And we're very glad to be working with the Baltic Industrial Symbiosis, and we hope it will continue and we'll have a lot of cool projects together that we can bring to life. That was Anastasia Sergeva, the Creative Project and Eco-Initiative Manager of Busha. Thanks for watching.